So I'm Judy Greenspan, the Director of Public Programs here at the Center for Jewish History. And on behalf of the Center and our partner organization, the American Jewish Historical Society, I'd really like to welcome you to tonight's program, First Person, A Dad's Mission After Parkland. Am I speaking into the mic? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so for those of you who have not been here before, First Person is the name of a conversation series that we offer here at the Center. And the idea behind it is to bring personal stories to our stage that are not only compelling and important on their own, but also open a window onto larger events in history and tonight onto our current moment in history. So we are really honored to host this evening's conversation between two very special guests, Fred Guttenberg, Parkland dad turned gun control activist, and Matt Gutman, ABC News Chief National Correspondent. Fred and Matt have come from opposite sides of the country tonight to discuss a critical issue that faces all of us. So I will not take the time in this introduction to recite the gun violence statistics that document this national crisis. Everyone in this room knows that the numbers are tragic, overwhelming, and as Clyde Haberman recently put it in the New York Times, quote, the derangement extends beyond schools to other venues once considered sanctuaries against a raging world, unquote. Parkland was not the last school shooting. It was not the last mass shooting. But as we know, it was a tipping point. The tragedy galvanized Americans across the country to march, to speak, to vote, and to force elected officials to pay attention. In our audience this evening, there are some people who have been working very hard towards this goal, and I would like to take a moment to acknowledge them. So, let's see, is Michael Snow here? I just, I don't know for sure. All right, so they may not all be here, but I will say anyway, representing Governor Cuomo's office, Michael Snow, Director of Jewish Affairs, is either here or not yet. Governor Cuomo has taken a lead on gun safety legislation in part due to the tremendous advocacy work of another Parkland family, Long Islanders Linda Beagle Shulman and Michael Shulman, whose son Scott Beagle was a teacher killed at Marjory Stoneham Douglas High School. Also here tonight, June Rubin, and I wish you would stand up, volunteer co-leader of the New York chapter of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense. Two people who will be coming, but they're not here yet, from every town for gun safety, and a very special group of Marjorie Stoneman, Stoneman Douglas alumni have come tonight to see Fred. And if you all would stand up. Thank you. A very special thanks in that group to Claire McHugh and Mike Hoston for getting the word out on social media. Finally, there's one more young woman I do want to bring your attention to, Ariel Geismer, who's right there. You can stand up. Also, she is a New Yorker <laughs> from Beacon High School, and among her many credentials that already fill a resume, and she's not even in college yet, Ariel is the founder and executive director of NYC Says Enough, a New York City coalition of high school students for public safety and gun reform laws and I suspect we will hear from Ariel in the years to come. So, I think it is very safe to say that most people who have followed the news over the last 15 months know the name Fred Guttenberg. Fred's 14-year-old daughter, Jamie, was one of the 17 students and teachers killed at Marjorie Stoneham Douglas High School on February 14th, 2018. The next day, Fred spoke at a vigil and embarked on an entirely unplanned life mission. One reporter summing up Fred's last 15 months wrote, quote, from the humble life of a father, husband, and middle-class American to steadfast activist, Fred Guttenberg has accepted a new calling. Another reporter wrote that Fred is considered, quote, one of the nation's loudest voices for common sense gun laws. And Fred has racked up 182,000 Twitter followers since February 2018 and has been described as standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Na National Rifle Association. In March, he joined lawmakers on Capitol Hill to introduce Jamie's Law. He started a foundation called Orange Ribbons for Jamie 
He will tell us about both this evening, and we've also left some information and ribbons on various tables around the room. We could not be more pleased that Matt Gutman is here with Fred this evening. If you watch ABC News, and of course you all do, you know Matt is the network's award-winning chief national correspondent. Based in California, he reports for all ABC News broadcasts and platforms, including World News Tonight with David Muir, 2020, Good Morning America, and Nightline. Matt has covered many of the major stories of the past decade, including terror in Europe, political upheaval at home, and more shootings than he'd like to remember, including Tree of Life and the Poway Synagogue shootings, to name two of them. He's also reported on good news, including that miraculous rescue of the boys' soccer team from a cave in Thailand, about which he wrote the 2018 book, The Boys in the Cave, Deep Inside the Impossible Rescue in Thailand. And in fact, coincidentally, after our conversation tonight, Matt is going to be accepting a Christopher Award given to stories that affirm the highest value of the human spirit for a 2020 program about that rescue. So he's busy this evening. So Fred and Matt's conversation tonight is an exceptionally meaningful one for us to host at the Center for Jewish History. Our first person series is part of our mission to preserve and tell our stories. And so before we begin, I'd like to say a word about this unusual organization. Can I see a show of hands of people who have never been here before? Wow, wonderful. So welcome to all of you. So to me, the Center for Jewish History is truly a rare gem in this city. It is a world-renowned research institute for scholars of Jewish history, a destination for public programs, concerts, exhibitions, a place to explore genealogy, and it is home to our five partner organizations and their extraordinary archival collections. The American Jewish Historical Society, the Leo Beck Institute, the American Sephardi Federation, Yeshiva University Museum, and the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research, our five partners, together possess the largest repository of Jewish archival material outside of Israel. And I think it's quite safe to say that most people walking by this building, many of whom think it's a post office, have absolutely no idea that tucked away inside is an astonishing treasure trove of materials that span a thousand years of history and include millions of documents, hundreds of thousands of books, thousands of artworks, ritual objects, recordings, and film. So here is a glimpse. If I can get where we go. Here is a glimpse of what that looks like. This is just part of one floor of one partner's archives. This one belonging to the American Jewish Historical Society in the 12-story building behind us. Relevant to our conversation tonight, this immense archive of Jewish history, not surprisingly, reveals a tradition of political activism and is filled with stories about people from other times and other places who united, fought back, and often against tremendous odds prevailed. You can find stories of sweatshop workers, labor leaders, civil rights activists, people galvanized into action by tragedy, by injustice, by the relentless need to right a wrong. People for whom thoughts and prayers were not doing the job then as they're not doing the job now, and who, as Fred says about himself, saw no choice but to jump into the fight. You can spend hours, you can spend years researching and digging up the stories in our archives, and they're not meant to be hidden away. Our online collections are accessible to the public, as are our reading room, genealogy institute, and library. Exhibitions, public programs, conferences draw from and showcase the treasures and stories in this building. So if you're not already on our mailing list, please sign up, pick up excuse me, pick up flyers of our upcoming programs, and we hope you will come back again and often. So thank you very much to our ASL interpreters this evening. There will be a Q&A after the conversation and a reception following the program. And now, without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Fred Guttenberg and Matt Gutman. Uh, a round of applause to Judy, who is incredible. 
you can tell that she's a former television producer by the attention to detail that she has in putting this together. And I'd never been here before either, but I'm incredibly impressed by this institution. I had no idea it existed here, and inside it's... Uh, Fred and I were pretty blown away. Um, so thank you everyone for being here, we appreciate it. Um, I think one of the things that astounds me most about Fred is his energy, and we've talked about it some. Uh, Judy mentioned that he has 182,000 Twitter followers, right? But I wonder how many times do you think, do you estimate, that you have spoken publicly or given TV or newspaper or any kinds of interviews or done something that's publicly active over the past 15 months? Done something publicly active? <clears throat> spoken, talked to people, met people. There isn't a week that I'm not. Um, you know... On February 15th, I went with my family and some of the people in this room were with me, were with me then um, to a vigil. And literally until the minute before leaving, I didn't know if I was going to go or not. My wife did not go. And when I got there, the mayor asked me to speak. And um, I let it rip. I was in a bad place. Um, I talked that night about feeling broken. Um, and I gave a speech that came from the heart and the head. And uh, since that night, I haven't been able to stop. I uh, travel pretty much weekly now, doing events, communicating this message, meeting with political leaders, um, talking about why I hate the phrase thoughts and prayers, to be quite honest. Because when you hear thoughts and prayers, it means somebody's going to a cemetery. Um, and, and why we need to do better, why we need to do more. Uh, at the end of February was when I first joined Twitter. Um, you know, so that's just been pretty organic over the past 15 months, but this is, this is the life I live now. Um, I can tell you I'm gonna take a little bit of a break for the next couple of weeks, because my son is graduating, uh, and we're gonna take a, a little vacation. But um, folks, the next election, for me, it means everything, and I am going to spend my life on the road working to make sure that after 2020, we have a House and a Senate and a President who are going to sign gun safety legislation. One of the things that Fred will say when you ask him about what he does, he will say he is not an activist. And whenever he speaks or whenever he speaks to politicians, what do you not do? I don't sit. He doesn't <laughs> <Stand>. sit. <laughs> and why don't you sit? So when, when I started doing this and I started looking back at all the other instances of gun violence, it was clear the reaction was always way too polite and way too temporary. And I had no desire to be polite, and I had no intention of being temporary. So everywhere I went, starting with that CNN town hall a week after my daughter was murdered, where I stood the entire night, everywhere I went, whether it be DC or a state house across the country or media interviews, I did it standing. I had studios that needed to rearrange because I wouldn't sit. Um, I had congressmen and senators who would invite me to sit in their seat, but I wouldn't do it, so they had a choice. They either had to stand and look me in the eye, or they could sit down and look up at me. But I wasn't going to make them comfortable. And... <laughs> the, the thing is, when the whole Kavanaugh handshake thing happened, the reason why he is just a liar, I'm sorry if there's anybody here who's a fan, I was about 20 feet away from him, and I was the only fool in the room standing. Everyone else is sitting. And so when Senator Feinstein introduced me, and you had all the cameras sitting on the floor there in front of the senators, they all started snapping away because I was there standing, and he looked over. So I, when I talk about what happened to my daughter, I don't have the need 
to make you feel comfortable about it. I have the need to make you react. I have the need to make you understand that as certain as I am that it happened to me, it could happen to you before this day ends. And if you don't think that way, and you don't react that way, then you're not gonna be part of doing what I need you to do to help fix this. So, but I'll be happy to sit tonight and make you all comfortable, so. <laughs> I'm okay standing if you prefer it. I, uh, it's really I'm, up to you. Look, I, I, let's stand. You are, no, sorry. I'm, I'm really gonna do it either way. <laughs> When I do any speaking engagements, I always stand and pace and stalk the stage. But Same. <laughs> we want to make you guys feel at home. Um, Fred, you know, I, I know you don't like to use the, he's a father, he's a dad. That's why he's doing this, not because he's an activist. But you are someone who is incredibly active in what you do. And this being a Jewish institution, I wondered, is there a Jewish influence in what you do? I was raised in a conservative Jewish home on Long Island. I was raised with Jewish values. I was raised with Jewish traditions. I was raised to always do what's right on behalf of others. I was raised to give back. I was raised with strong values and to fight for those things that I value. That is the Jewish upbringing in me. Um, so that plays a really strong role in what I do. You know, look, on this whole activist thing, I am. I'm uncomfortable being called that. Um, and, um, you know, again, I, I see some folks in this room who were with me the week after my daughter died. Um, I went on a mission that week, but I went on it as Jamie's dad. I, I don't want to be an activist. I want to be a dad of two children. And, I'm, and, and the way I'm conducting myself now, and, and it took me a while to process this, um, for the first almost year, I kept on saying, Jamie was my daughter. And it, and I, I, it was so hard for me to say it. And it was almost a year later when we were doing the unveiling of her tombstone where I started saying, you are my daughter. And I do this as her dad. I, I am a parent reacting to what happened to my child. So as certain as I am on being a dad to my son, who thank God didn't get killed that day, but he was there and he heard his sister getting shot, I am gonna continue being a father to my daughter. And for me now, that means dealing with the reality of what happened to her life. And I can't stop. It, 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 um, let's put it this way. In the uh, proximate hour that we will be here, somebody will be finishing burying a victim of gun violence. Somebody will be learning they're a victim of gun violence. And somebody will be planning a funeral for a victim of gun violence. I can't in good conscience sit here and let that happen. The guilt that I have that I didn't put my voice into this until it was my daughter is something that weighs me down every day, and I'm not going to stop. Every year in the United States, approximately 40,000 people are killed because of guns um, or by guns, 12,000 homicides about. Um, there are shootings. I, I did the math earlier since March 31st. I think there have been something like 50 mass shootings in the United States since March 31st. Um, but the ultimate derangement are school shootings. Um, there is nothing that seems to be more wrong than that. Maybe, you know, we, we've learned what happened at the end of that horrific and fateful day for you, but maybe you can take us through that day and, and how you learned about Jamie. So, February 14th, Valentine's Day. And my daughter was 14 and I actually had a whole plan that night for Valentine's Day where I took my wedding video that was still on VHS or whatever they call it, and I digitized it. And we were gonna watch it as a family. And I wanted, I, I, I couldn't wait to actually have this first really special Valentine's Day with my now teenage daughter. That morning started in my house like any other morning in my house. And 
that means it was chaotic. You know, my kids were running late. They were arguing over whose fault it was. My dogs needed attention. Um, my wife and I needed to get out the door. And I was talking to some other people about this earlier today, and I've talked about this before. I am haunted by what I don't remember. I think I was so busy rushing my children out the door that morning, not expecting it to be the last time, that I don't think I said, I love you. I don't know that I took the time to look my daughter the last time I saw her in the eye and say, I love you. I rushed them out the door. You got to get to school. You got to get to school. And um, the day went on like a normal day. My daughter and my wife had a really special connection. I mean, anything that went on got communicated. If my daughter's shoelace got tied, my wife to let her know. I think there's a thing going on with the wire here, so I'm going to try to hold it a little higher. Um, but that day was going on like a normal day until just after two when my son calls me, who could be a jokester, and he goes, Dad. And I'm like, what? And he goes, Dad. And I'm like, what? And he goes, no, I'm serious. And I was like, what's up? He goes, there's a shooter at my school, and I can't find Jamie. And as soon as he said he couldn't find his sister because he watched her like a hawk, I knew he was deadly serious. My son is now on the phone with me Worried not about himself, but that he couldn't find his sister. And he's running, and he says, and I hear bullets. I said, you run faster. You keep running. Now, the thing is, the bullets he was hearing were the bullets that were killing his sister. His, she was on the third floor. The gap when he was talking to me originally is when the killer was moving up the stairs. My daughter was one of the kids who did not get killed in a classroom, she got killed in the hallway, and so unfortunately there's also video of it. And what I know about it is she made it to within one second of her life because she was running down the hallway, and it's on video from an active shooter with an AR-15 at her back, turning into a stairwell. One more second and she makes it, and boom! And yes, I live with that in my head every day. A single shot severed her spinal cord. I am a father who hopes his daughter died instantly because the alternative is she suffered. The alternative is she may have been paralyzed and couldn't say anything to anybody. I hope she died instantly, and I fear that she didn't. So that day, we... Um, get the phone calls, my wife and I are panicking, trying to find our daughter. I eventually locate my son, and we try to find her phone, and we determine it's actually still in the building. And all of her friends are calling their parents, but my daughter, nothing. So my wife and I decide to go to the hospital. And um, we were in two separate cars, because my wife was teaching a class in another school, and she was on lockdown. So we met at the hospital in two cars. Spent about an hour and a half there. They couldn't find her in any hospital. Now my wife and I leave in a panic. We still haven't heard anything. One of my very best friends, who was one of the SWAT officers that went into the school, um, I called him after the hospital, and he agreed to go back and look. And as my wife and I are turning onto the highway, I get a call from him saying, meet me at the Marriott Hotel. We'll talk there. I'm like, what do you mean we'll talk there? Talk about what? He's like, well, meet me there, and, and, and we can just go over. And like, you know something. What's going on? And he broke down crying, and he said, she's gone. Now I'm in my car crying, and my wife, who's in the car in front of me, can see in her rearview mirror. So now she's calling me saying, what's going on? And I said, nothing. We're going to meet Scott at the Marriott Hotel. She's like, no, no, no. You know something. You need to tell me now. And I didn't want to tell her because she was driving, and I didn't want to cause her to get into an accident. But she was insistent, so we pulled off the side of the road. And on the side of the road is where I told my wife that our daughter was murdered. Um, and the rest is history. If you want to know why I do what I do today, it's because every one of you in this room loves somebody. It could be a sibling, a parent, a child, a grandparent, a cousin, a friend. And every one of you, you mentioned school shootings. 
This doesn't just happen in schools. It happens in temples, it happens in movie theaters, it happens in malls. Every one of you needs to understand if we don't deal with the reality of the, what gun violence does, we all potentially are victims. And, and the craziness is this is fixable, this is preventable. And I, I will not stop with my voice in this until every single person understands that and is ready to do something about it. Just to be clear, when you say gun violence, it's a euphemism. What you're saying is guns. What you're yeah, saying oh, yeah. is the ubiquity of weapons in America, as I understand. Yes. Um, you know, listen, <laughs> there's already millions of guns out there, um, and there is millions more sold every year. Um, there was once an assault weapons ban. Now you have millions of assault weapons being sold for private consumption every year. We have a gun problem in this country, and we don't yet have the legislative will in D.C. to take it on seriously. The House finally has the legislative will. The Senate doesn't. Um, you know, J Judy mentioned Jamie's law before. The reason that there's such, such a thing called Jamie's law is to deal with gun violence, it's not only about dealing with the guns being sold in the future and how to keep those out of people's hands, but it's also dealing with the reality that there's millions of guns in people's hands now that probably shouldn't have them. In fact, when I started taking on the gun lobby and they started reacting, they started saying early on, and they weren't wrong, you can't do anything about this problem. There's already too many guns out there. And they weren't wrong. And it's part of the gun problem now. But they don't work without ammunition. And so I was sitting with Congressman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, expressing my concern, and she said, if you're a prohibited purchaser of guns, you are prohibited by law from buying ammunition. The problem is there's no requirement for a background check. So any kid, anybody who has a gun illegally and can't buy a gun legally can still go in and buy the ammunition. Jamie's Law, which is now in front of the House and the Senate, is a bill that will extend background checks to ammunition because in order to address this problem, we need to deal with the guns that are already out there as well as future purchasers of guns. In the attack on the Poway Synagogue, which I covered a couple weeks ago, uh, in San Diego, the shooter who espoused you know, anti-Semitic yep. fascist views openly um, and then told the police about it, purchased the gun on a Friday. It was a semi-automatic AR-style weapon and then used it the Saturday morning. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's still incredibly easy. Even in California, which has more restrictive laws than almost any state in the country. Um, so when we hear, you know, sensible gun laws, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Well, number one, I am a huge believer in extreme risk protection orders. Some people call them red flag laws. That's what they're called in Florida. And extreme risk protection orders will remove through judicial order so that there's a judicial process involved weapons from those who are a known threat to themselves or someone else or a certified domestic abuser because they've already shown they're violent. And the reason why I'm a big believer in them is that, that is a law that actively works to remove weapons from those who intend to kill. Listen, I have no, I'm not against the Second Amendment. I'm not looking to remove weapons from lawful gun owners. I want to remove those who intend to kill from access to weapons. It's that simple. And this guy in California, very similar to the guy in Pennsylvania, they were online expressing a level of violence and hatred that should have been known and it should have caused a restrictive reaction to prevent him from buying those weapons. New York State, actually, I don't think they passed it yet, but they're going to, is in the process of actually allowing social media to be used in the process of doing background checks so that people like that won't be able to go spew their hatred and their violence online and then go ahead and act on it. It's a really complicated issue, yeah. right? Because on the one hand, there is so much crap and gibberish spewed out online and in social media. 
Um, this kid in, in Poway in, uh, who shot up the synagogue in, near San Diego um, had been saying ridiculous things online, um, not for that long, but he also had a diverse group of friends. He had a 4.0 plus GPA. He was a classical pianist. His father was a prominent lifeguard. The kids surfed. Like You would never imagine yeah. that this kid would try to follow in the footsteps of the New Zealand shooter and target Jews because they are the scum of the earth and the cause of all the ills. There's so much noise out there. How do you find the right ones? How do you know who is actually going to just let off steam online versus, and if you call it let off steam, versus take action? Well, listen, background checks. And as part of a background check process, you have to have an online component. You have to be able to check people's online profiles if they want to have access to weapons. Uh, this is not about an alienation of anybody's right, because you all have a right to live. My daughter had a right to live. Okay, So if you want to buy a weapon, it is, it is the right thing for a gun seller to make sure you're not out there in some subversive way online expressing views that might be important for a future action. And so background checks are critical, but having the ability to go to the social media component is, is part of this. This country needs to deal with the reality of the hate-filled social media and, and how we can deal with it. In some ways, what you're saying is that your words do matter, yes. that there are repercussions for things that you say in the online sphere that it's not just, you know, dissolved in the ether net, you know, that these things actually count. Um, and sorry, what do you... No, l listen, you, that, but that's it. Your word, if you are projecting hateful intentions, that has to be known. You, you, can't, you, you can't say, oh, Second Amendment while on the same day going online and saying, I'm going to kill somebody. You know, this is not rocket science. This is such a fixable problem, and you will not stop all gun violence. Traffic lights don't stop every traffic accident. They stop most of them. But if you're projecting hateful intent, that has to be part of the process that is understood when you go to buy a weapon. I'm curious. I'm going to take a very unscientific poll of our uh, astute group here. What do folks think causes gun violence, quote unquote, gun violence in America? What, what's the root cause? Mental illness, says the front. Anger. Guns. Availability of guns. Yes, sir. Political climate. Powers. People do it for power, says the young... Say that again? Certainly. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we have, uh, we have mental illness, we have the political climate, we have guns, the availability of guns. Um, what else did we have? I think I missed something. Anger, which is... And, and so one of the things that you and I talked about earlier was you know, the other cause. Because yes, the availability of guns certainly makes it easier to shoot people. Um, but, you know, as a reporter who spent cumulatively uh, a decade in Israel and the Middle East, you know, anybody been to Israel? You ever see any guns there? Oh, yeah. Big guns, long guns, automatic guns everywhere. Um, readily available uh, with lots of ammunition. And yet, they don't have this problem, right? America's the only place. So what differentiates us? Hopelessness. And so, so I'm going to bring this back full circle. Yeah. And we talked about this. Yeah, I, yeah. My theory is that it's the lack of community, it's social isolation, which kind of taps into what everybody was saying and the availability of guns, it seems like. Well, it, it, so because I'm going to challenge you a little bit. Okay. Um, I like that. So two thirds of all shoot, mass shootings, according to the FBI, to actually did not have a mental health component. Um, but mental health is a huge part of it. Anger is a huge part of it. Um, access is a huge. All of these are part of it. What makes the United States unique is how easy it is to get weapons, especially 
in any moment, at any time. You know, you go to other countries, Israel is an outlier, but most other countries, there's limits on the kinds of weapons you can buy, and buying weapons is a lot harder. And there's appropriate waiting periods, and there's background checks, and here's why that's important. A lot of gun violence is done in the moment out of emotion. It's done in the moment when you maybe are, you know, you know, mental health doesn't run on a straight line. And so if you have barriers to access, because when you asked about, you know, what are the different components of gun violence, the first one out of everyone's mouth should be the gun. <laughs> you know, so when you have the easy access to the gun and then you throw in all these other components, you have a unique situation here in this country. And again, fixable and preventable. But you have, I heard somebody out there say the NRA. Um, I see my cousin back there who was at my house the week my daughter was killed. And I walked around my house that entire week saying, and I'll clean it up, I'm going to break that effing lobby. Because they are, to me, the biggest reason. We as a country have had this problem escalating and escalating and escalating and we have done nothing about it. Incidents after incidents after incidents. And what I really am just pissed off about, to be quite honest, is you have the other side of this argument that will use things like they'll say mental health, but they'll never do anything about it. Okay? So I agree, mental health is part of this. So what's the plan to fix it? Okay? Why are you cutting mental health budgets if you think that's part of the problem? You know, so they want to politicize it. They want to talk about everything but the gun. We need to deal with the fact that America has a unique access to guns, and we have to find a way to tamp that down. I don't disagree, and I don't think anybody here can. I mean, what's the number of total guns in America? 400 million? There are more guns in the United States than there are people. And owned by not a very large percentage of people. Right. The majority. But I yeah. think the, the, the average gun owner has six to eight. Multiple weapons, yeah. And by the way, so the last shooting that I covered was in Denver, or just outside of Denver, um, not far from Littleton, Colorado, where the Aurora shooting, where the, the, the Columbine took place. Um, and this shooter took his father's guns uh, and gave one to an accomplice who also shot up a school. Folks, um, but that's why you need to vote. Right now, to me, one of the most sensible, no-brainer things to do would be to pass a safe storage law that would require gun owners to lock up their weapons and would put gun, make gun owners responsible if their weapons were not properly stored and locked up. It is the kind of thing everybody should agree on. But you have a Senate right now that won't even allow it to come for a vote. There is a bill in front of the Senate. You can't even get a Republican sponsor. And here's the thing. Gun violence is a nonpartisan issue. Bullets don't know if you're Republican or Democrat. They don't know if you're rich or poor. They know nothing about you other than the fact that if they hit you, they're probably going to kill you. But you have a Senate right now under the McConnell leadership that won't even allow a vote, and you have senators who won't even sponsor. There are Republicans in the Senate and across this country who would vote for this stuff if they could simply get the opportunity. It's not partisan, but right now, we need to do something about that leadership. Safe storage bills, and they can't even get behind it. So the sheriff of Douglas County, Colorado, which is where the shooting at the school was near Denver, uh, texted me, sorry, I was looking on my phone, that's why, uh, Tuesday. Um, they, his citizens, the people of, of the good people of Douglas County, are trying to run a recall on him because he's trying to save a few lives over taking guns away from mentally ill people. Um, and so they're trying to put some up, someone up. That against story him. is actually worse than that. Because Why? That, because that elected official who the recall is on lost his son to gun violence. And the reason why he is so committed to this issue... The guy who's trying to unseat the current sheriff? The, 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 the elected official in Colorado, and I can't remember his name, who's currently serving, who's trying to pass red flag laws, oh, okay. who's 
the subject of a recall election? And I'm assuming we're talking about the same person. Maybe not. Tony Spurlock, Douglas County. I don't think so because I would have okay. known that if his there is child someone had... There is someone else in Colorado who lost his son in a shooting who has championed red flag laws, ex extreme risk protection orders, who lost his son to gun violence, and they're running a recall election or trying to against him. So uh, I'm going to try to continue to bring this back because we are at the, the Center for Jewish History. Um, uh, one of the problems, it's not just mental illness, which is something that is diagnosed. I, I believe that there is a, an endemic problem in America of dislocation and lack of community. Now, my belief in God and spirituality certainly isn't what it used to be. I'm agnostic, ver verging on atheist. I'm not sure, given any history, and if anybody reads history, that certainly not an activist God or any kind of God exists. However, more than ever, especially as the father of two children, um, and so aware of people's history like Fred's, that community is one of the things that matters most. And so I am active in our synagogue, and we do go on retreats. And lately I've actually tried to do a device Sabbath, which is not looking at the phone at all from sunset Friday to sunset Saturday. So Fred, one, does that something that makes sense? Is that something, the dislocation that makes sense with you? And two, where does your Judaism or your upbringing come into play here? Or your belief in God? Do you still believe in God? We're in a divorce. And that's the truth. Um, he and God, he means. Yeah. Let me, let me fill in some gaps here. Four months before my daughter was murdered, my brother died of cancer related to 9-11. My brother ran the triage for 9-11. He was one of a group of doctors they were in the World Trade Center when it collapsed and amazingly survived that and spent 16 days at ground zero and years later got the cancer that eventually took his life. I'll never forget being in hospice and the rabbi asking us how we were doing. And I was honest. I told the rabbi I was angry that my 50-year-old brother who has spent his life giving to others to be losing it this way I didn't think was fair. But the rabbi said something to me that satisfied me. And he talked about God's plan and how my brother did more in his 50 years than most people will in 100. And that, for, that it was time to use him and bring him to another place. And that my brother would be okay. And I was okay with that. Until four months later when my daughter was murdered my 14-year-old baby. Tell me God's plan on that one. No one has been able to satisfy me. Some people have said maybe it was to get me involved in this activism. I didn't need this. I needed my kid. I wanted to do the things I dreamt about. I wanted to harass that boy first boyfriend. I wanted to walk her down the aisle. I wanted to teach her to drive, and I should be planning a sweet 16 right now. I didn't need this. And so I, I have lost my ability to feel that spiritual connection. What's the crazy, though, and the flip side of that is my faith in people and community got stronger than it's ever been. I have met amazing people who, many of you are in this room who I didn't know a year and a half ago. Or those, or some in this room who I knew my whole life, but who we've reconnected. I have met amazing people who have been pillars of strength for me, who have guided me, whether it be in the world of politics, or in media, or entertainment, or just new friends. Um, you know, my faith in people is stronger than it's ever been right now. There are people who have no need to feel they have to do anything for me or to be good to me, but they have been. They have held my hand. They have guided me. They have made sure I know how to get where I need to go. And so in spite of the... Um, the vile side of social media, 
There's someone in this audience, and I can't see where he's sitting, who I know only because of a group that I'm part of on social media, who were a group of activists that kind of have collected into a group, supporting one another. And he's here tonight. And he didn't need to come. You know, my faith in people has become stronger than ever. Last month I was in Pittsburgh with the Tree of Life families. And I went with a few other Parkland families. We, we cried together. But, you know, we're all part of this crazy club now. And I know we helped them, but they helped us too. And so while I, the truth is, and I spoke in their temple about this, so it's not like I haven't said this in other settings. The truth is, I've lost my um, connection right now to, to God. My, the way I was raised, my Jewishness, my cultural background, my belief in, in the community and family and people, stronger than it's ever been. You've experienced this incredible surge of support, both online and in person with all these people you've met. And you talk about hate speech online. But there's also a possible physical aspect to it. I mean, some people, it, literally these are the people who go out and say, we're going to shoot someone up. They say it on, what, the, on YouTube or Twitter, yeah. and then they'll go do it. And they can execute these crimes. Are you concerned about your own safety? I mean, you are a target. You've said you're going to break the gun lobby. You're going out there against white supremacists, against hate-filled speech online. Are you concerned that people are going to try to take practical action against you? My wife and my son are. <laughs> I'm not. Um, my, my brother was under the World Trade Center when it was collapsing. My daughter went running down a hallway from an active shooter. What they had was fear and anxiety. I'll never have what they had. And I, in a weird way, I've lost the ability to have fear or anxiety. Um, what people do on social media is just words. Some people have crossed a bit of a line, and we've had to get law enforcement involved with some weird threats. Uh, but you're... I'll put it to you this way. Unless someone has a way of bringing my daughter back to me, I'm not stopping. When you do speaking engagements, tonight you advertised, but typically, no. do you tell people in advance where you're going to be? Nope. Do you say it online? Nope. After the fact is usually when I'll go online and talk about what I was just doing. Typically, I won't self promote ahead of time because I don't want to give people my schedule, not just for my safety. I don't want people knowing when I'm not home. So, so, you know, there's been a couple of times with events that I've done where I've had to do that, but typically we do not. One of the things that we've been seeing lately as a result of these shootings are officials talking about what to do. And one of the things that people have latched onto recently, I don't know if you've noticed this, are the heroes in these mass shootings. And I think we're specifically talking about mass shootings either in public mm -hmm. venues or in schools. So in this last school shooting outside of Denver, one of the students essentially lunged at the shooter, taking a number of bullets, uh, giving his friends and class, his classmates, just enough time to jump the shooter. One of the other kids got shot twice. One of the kids was unscathed, but, you know, one kid died and another man was shot twice and now they're essentially being called heroes slash martyrs is that something fred that's healthy for our society it is, is that so, something it we is want so to abnormal encourage? it just it pisses me off and and because while everybody is thankful for that hero no 12 year old boy should be giving his life because we have a gun problem in this country it irritates the hell out of me and when we start thinking and and talking in terms of how excited we are that there was a hero, we are normalizing gun violence. And I'm not okay with it, no. I'm thankful for everyone else in that school who didn't get shot, but a 12-year-old boy gave his life. Now, do I wish there was a hero in the school when my daughter was killed? Hell yeah. 
Okay, I do. But I am not ready to act in a way where we're going to be okay with such a gun violence problem in this country that we're going to say, yeah, we know it's a good thing. We'll get more heroes out there and, you know, we'll put more guns in security's hands and we'll do this, we'll do that, but we're not going to fix the problem. I'm not okay with it. My heart breaks for that family. Um, the, the, you had the same situation in the North Carolina shooting, you know? Exactly. Um, it is not normal. It's not. It's a bit, so uh, I agree. I don't, it's the definition of not normal, right? When mm -hmm. you basically tell the children in schools, we can't really do anything to defend you, so you're going to have to defend yourselves. You're it's in it alone, kid. You know? And it's worse than that. Because of the gun problem that is not being addressed, kids are now in schools being taught how to deal in the event of an active shooter situation, and they're being coached on how to be heroes. Instead of dealing with the problem, no parent, no kid, no voting American should be okay with that. Anybody out there have kids in, in school, elementary school, middle school, high school? You're a high schooler. All right. I forgot your name. Oh, yeah. Ari, how could I forget? Sorry. What do they teach you? What do they tell you? Can you guys hear her? So in kindergarten, I remember that um, you always need to locate the doorway and then go out of sight. Um, there's like a poem now that they're teaching kindergartners, like lock the door, out of sight, go away. Um, and so I remember almost every single classroom I go into right now, I locate, okay, if there was a shooter, where would I go? Um, and it's usually me ending up, oh, like I would hide in this closet or I would put that bookcase in front of me. Um, because it's the way I've been taught to think, um, and it's the way that the instability of our school system has given me, that this is the way I need to think. Um, so most doors in my school have to have a small entrance way so we can stand on the other side. Um, so if there was ever a situation, um, we would have to go out of that way. In the, I think it was in the Colorado shooting. There was another 12-year-old boy who actually had pre-thought what he would do if a shooter came into his room. And he knew where there was a, an aluminum pole. I think, if I can't remember his name, you, you may have covered the, the kid. Brandon but, something. Yeah, yeah but he, was, he talked about how he was prepared, if a shooter ever came into his room, to grab that aluminum pole, and he was prepared that oh, day no, to do it. A bat, he had his hand, the it, was a bat. Bat. it was a 12 year old with a bat. Who, who, he was in the, the school gymnasium, and his teacher said hide, and he said, you know, if I'm going down, I'm going to go down swinging, and he just white-knuckled this base, aluminum our, baseball bat. Our 12-year-old kids should be thinking about how to get an A, not how to stop a shooter in school. True, but we essentially live in a society where this kind of conflict is a present reality. And we need how to fix it. Having lived in the Middle East for many years... Um, and always being on call back when cell phones were just cell phones without the smart part in them. Um, I would take runs in Tel Aviv where I lived, and anytime I saw a bus, I would be thinking, what would I do if it exploded? Where would I take cover? I would think about where I would go when there, if there was a shooting, how I would protect myself, doorways, protection. And I experienced a lot of blood and guts, frankly. I mean, but that's the mentality that our school children are subjected to now, which is essentially living in something akin to a war zone. It is like the Middle East, like Israel during the peak of the Intifada from 2001 to 2004. You got to be well, prepared because it's I'm not likely, it's possible and it's I'm not, happen. And I'm not okay with it, and that's why we're going to fix this. So what happens, Fred? One of the thi you can you can applaud that. <laughs> You're like to put it. Uh, to use this analogy, which is, you know, you're like a, a bullet shot out of a gun. You have fired into this space of, um, you know, common sense, no-nonsense gun laws, 
into attacking the NRA, uh, that lobby, into lobbying Congress and the Senate to do something about it. But one of the things that is your fuel is the grief. That's what enables you to be the dad and not the activist. How long can you keep it up? How long can a father like you keep that up, keep up this pace? My, uh, my intention is to stand after 2020 with a new Senate and a new president who will sign gun safety legislation or declare a national emergency with gun violence um, because apparently we can do those things now. Um, and then go deal with my grief in a different way. Um, but what keeps me going now, what keeps, I find when I'm not doing this, I find when I'm not reacting to what happened to my kid is when I get into a really weak, sad place. Um, and so for me, this seems more natural and normal. You know, Vice President Biden, I had the extreme honor of meeting him a, just about a month after Jamie was killed, and how he was incredibly generous with his time. But he really gave me the greatest advice, and he spent a lot of time talking to me about mission and purpose. And now that's a man who knows his share of grief. And he was really very personal and shared some very private details to help me understand how every day he kind of helped it to maybe feel a little less painful. This is mission and purpose for me. I don't know what else to do. I know it's all I think about every day. I have my daughter's final seconds on an endless loop in my head running down that hallway. The only way I feel like I can handle that is doing something about it. And that's what we're going to keep on doing. And um, I don't intend to fail at this. So. I have a mac I, Okay, uh, I'll skip that one now. Um, What's that? Did you actually watch the video? So... No, okay. Um, and I debated for a while if I wanted to, and and I don't. It'll eventually because there'll be a criminal trial. It's probably eventually going to become public record. Um, I hope not, and I'll do everything to prevent that because it'll torture my family, and they don't need to see it. Um, but we have not watched it. But it's been described to me in detail. I've heard you speak many times, and we've been speaking for about an hour now. The one thing you haven't mentioned is the name of the shooter and the shooter himself. I won't. Um, I don't use his name. Just I just refer to him as the killer, the shooter, but I, I don't talk about his name. Does it even matter who he was, who he is? You mean... In terms of I mean, maybe helping he, me to understand something? Are these shooters interchangeable? It's not, it's, the, the problem, I think, that what you're saying is not necessarily this particular shooter. It's the his, situation that allows him to take. There's this nothing kind of about his life action. that matters to me. Um, I, I, um, I wish he could just be put away in a jail cell forever and let the prisoners there deal with him as they want. Um, yeah, but unfortunately, because the state wants to try him, he's in a very protected status right now, um, which I'm not real thrilled about. No, I, I, I want awful things to happen to him, and um, I have no compassion, and there's nothing that anybody could say to me about him that will help me to have compassion for him. He was unfortunately a, a kid who planned this thing for a long time and um, we all know the story of all the failures but he pulled it off and he took my baby from me. He took my girl. 
And there, he did. And, and there are hundreds of those people. And there are thousands of parents like Fred out there. He's just the one who has channeled this massive grief into action. Um, one thing that we in the media have been doing more often is, and we're very conscious of it, is not mentioning the names of the shooters more than once. It's newsworthy once, say who it is in a piece, because you're talking about these people and sometimes you're showing them in court, but that's it. After that, it's the shooter, it's the gunman, it's the whatever. Um, but we are working diligently on doing whatever we can not to glorify them. Which, which I'm very thankful for. Um, you know, coming out of Parkland, that was one of those things that we all fought for, fought for called the no notoriety campaign. Um, and it's been successful. Listen, um, I'm very, um, as I said on February 15th, when I spoke at the vigil, this time, this shooter and everyone who enabled him messed with the wrong community and the wrong dad. And we as a community out of Parkland have changed the thought process on how to deal with these things, what to expect. And we have shown that you don't have to put up with the direction that this country was going as being normal. And, and I'm very proud of my Parkland families and the Parkland kids for what we have done, what we will continue to do. Some of us have really focused on the gun part of this. For example, me and the kids. Some of the parents have done unbelievable work with school security. But, but we've all channeled our grief to try and make people safer to lower the gun violence death rate, to help secure schools. Because you know what? You all have the right to walk out of here without fear of being shot and to be safe. Have you been able to define why it is that Parkland itself has become sort of the catch-all phrase for certainly school shootings? I mean. Nobody's going to remember if I say Littleton, Colorado, people don't necessarily associate that with Columbine. But when you hear Parkland, you know exactly what it is. Why do you think that is? So there's a couple of reasons. Um, and we'll start with the moment of the shooting. Those kids, you know, I'm going to pull this out for a second. Everybody thought this was destroying our kids. You know, our kids are always planted in their phones. Guess what? They took out and they recorded the shooting. You couldn't escape the violence now. It was recorded. And th the other thing about this is, again, we all thought our kids couldn't communicate because we thought they lived in their phones. And what the Parkland kids showed us is not only do they know how to communicate, and the kids around the country, such as you, have picked up on this, you do know how to communicate. You're fierce in asking what you, what you want. And this became your weapon. You guys are able to communicate and organize in ways that leave us adults in your dust. So that's part of it. The other part of it is... And you mean like March for Our Lives oh yeah. and these massive demonstrations that occurred yep. across the country. Yeah, oh yeah. The other part of it is the Parkland community and the parents. We immediately jumped into this fight. We haven't gone away. Uh, you know, I have spent my life, and I haven't shut up. I, did, I set out to break a gun lobby, and I haven't let off for a day. Max Schachter set out to create national school safety standards, and he's in D.C. right now getting that accomplished. You know, Manny Oliver, he's very much like me. Only he does what I do with words, he does with art. And he is still traveling the country, making his voice and message heard. We're not going away. And we somehow or another managed through all those different, you know, the video, the kids, and the parents who haven't shut up. We've managed to hold 
the attention and convince, thankfully, the country that what's happening isn't normal. And so the father who won't shut up and who won't sit down has had some success, right? This, is, this has been an utterly depressing conversation. Um, but, Fred, there have been accomplishments and there have been a lot successes. So city by city, state by state, gun safety legislation is now passing. The gun lobby, which used to be able to stop it all, now they're incapable of stopping legislation. All they have left is litigation. They can't afford to file all the lawsuits that they're filing. And so I tell every mayor and governor that I'm with, keep passing legislation because we'll bankrupt the NRA when we do it. So <laughs> the business community, and, and this also gets to Parkland, because I think this was a big part of Parkland just being different. Dick's Sporting Goods, and you all need to go shop at Dick's Sporting Goods. Within weeks, not even weeks, within I think less than two weeks, they announced that they're gonna stop selling assault weapons in their stores, and they're raising the age for any weapon to 21. They have since announced they're removing weapons altogether. Now, The VP of marketing at Dick's Sporting Goods at the time was a personal friend of mine. He is someone who I knew from my days when I was a Dunkin' Donuts franchisee. So they had a personal connection to Parkland and they decided they're gonna change their business practice as a result. Walmart followed suit within one day. Only like two weeks later, the state of Florida, my conservative state, that has the worst gun laws in the country, passed gun safety legislation against the NRA wishes. So all of a sudden, you had all of these cracks in the NRA armor, and now the dynamic was changing. And the NRA, they're coming apart at the seams at the moment. Don't, nobody pat themselves on the back yet. We gotta keep on fighting, because they're still there, but they are coming apart. They're a financial mess. They're all suing each other, but they're still filing litigation to stop good legislation. So don't be fooled. We got to keep fighting, but we're going in the right direction. We are getting things done. In the presidential election, you will see gun safety in 2020 be a top three voting issue. Okay, Eric Swalwell really kicked it off when he announced his run one night and he was in Parkland the next day with a public event, which... I was part of Mom's Demand was there and a bunch of the other kids. And when I spoke after Congressman Swalwell, I said, you just catapulted gun safety into the presidential election. And he did, because you now see all the other candidates starting to introduce really great plans on how to reduce gun violence. Not all the same plans, but plans that give them something to debate over and run on. And you will see gun safety be a primary voting issue in the next election. You bet success right now, and it's only a matter of time. Fred Guttenberg. We're going to open it up for questions, if anybody has any. Yes, sir. We're going we're to hand you a microphone. Oh. Of course. Hold on, but can you say it into the microphone? We're going to pass you... I said, I agree with you uh, completely about guns. Um, I want to say God is the creator of life. He gave people free will. And because we're not puppets, God doesn't control what every person does. So just about religious belief, that's what I had to say. And I, and I appreciate that. I, I'm struggling with this one, trust me. Um, I, I grew up in a conservative home. I've been religious my whole life. I've been through a pretty bad two-year period. And, and so I'm struggling with it right now. Uh, so uh, over here? Yeah. Go ahead. You have 225 or so allies here in the room who are with you. Thank um, you. Tactically speaking, strategically, specifically speaking, 
what can we do to help you relegate people like Mitch McConnell to the <laughs> dust heap of history? Specifically, because as you know, right, we don't change the Senate. We don't have anything, anything. Oh, absolutely. So what specific advice have you gotten from people like Deborah Wasserman Schultz or other people to, if you had 225 and a lot of money in this room, what can we do? Number one, every single one of you, your vote does matter. We'll start there. So vote. But, but be vocal. Be vocal. Don't, there, there is a minority that is really loud that manages to drive the, um, the, the conversation often. And the majority of us need to get more vocal. We need to say, uh-uh, this ain't normal and we're not okay with this. Use your voice in public, get active on social media. There, there, it, it is okay to go on social media and be civil and be polite and be decent and have that resonate because we've got this very active minority that has used lack of civility, lack of politeness and lack of decency to get a lot of newsworthy attention, but they're a minority and we need to get more vocal and we need to talk about voting and we need to make sure we vote. Uh, we have a question back, yeah. Um, yeah, hi, sorry. Um, my question is, now we have 225 people here who all agree with you, including me, what the work you're doing is phenomenal. Um, my question is, I have family in South Dakota and they're all members of the NRA and they're gun lovers and having a conversation with them initially is very controversial because they think I'm a liberal and I don't understand. But then when you talk over a drink about just gun storage laws, you know, simple things like that, they're like, oh, yeah, well, we agree with that. We just yeah. hate you liberals, you're going to take our guns away. So it's one thing, I, we need to galvanize ourselves, but I feel like there's a lot of preaching to the choir. How do we talk to the people who sponsor the NRA, which are my relatives there, and get them to realize that, yeah, how do we get them to the table? Like, are you talking to the other side? I think that's a great question, and the answer is yes. You know, I was in Cincinnati back in October before the election, and I was campaigning for their gubernatorial candidate, and someone was in the crowd who's a farmer, he's got a lot of property, and he and his kids like to shoot on the property. And I believe nobody should be able to buy a gun until they're 21. And he got up and he's like, you just wanna keep my kids from being able to shoot guns on our property? And, and I said, no. And, he, and he's like, so you don't believe that it should be 21? I said, you shouldn't be able to purchase until you're 21. But what you do on your private property, as long as you're a responsible gun owner who's securing your weapons so that your kids are not gonna use them when they're unsupervised, that's your business. He goes, oh. Well, I didn't, so I, I think the answer to your question is, we just simply need to talk to them. And most gun owners, the majority, if you go by polls, actually believe in the same common sense reforms that I believe in. You have a gun lobby that has the sole purpose of selling weapons, and they use language that makes it sound like guys like me want to go grab people's guns. It's a lie, it's not true. But when you talk to people and you explain to them, no lawful gun owner, and I use Florida as an example. No lawful gun owner since we passed legislation in Florida has lost a weapon. But we've managed to keep some killers from getting their weapons. I'm gonna scare you all a little bit. Um, sorry. It's all good. I had lunch last week with the um, special agent in charge of the uh, ATF office in LA. So he's in charge of like 50 million people. It's from the, I guess, parts of New Mexico, Arizona, California. A third of the guns that they are seizing are 
do-it-yourself weapons that people are buying. They're basically a Glock 19 that people are able to buy. And then, as Fred mentioned, because anybody can get ammunition, all you have to do is load it, and you have an unmarked, unlicensed gun that anybody can buy online and get it shipped to your house. You load it, you shoot it. Nobody knows where it came from. Um, Listen, it is the reason why I think the focus of gun legislation has to also include ammunition. I mean, which is what the ATF says as yeah, well, yeah. basically. I, I'm in complete agreement with that. But I, I did not know that. A no, third no. of the weapons they're seizing are the kinds you can just order online, put together, assemble, and then use. Listen, That's here's the thing. reality. Because you all maybe saw some of the news over the summer about 3D, print at home, do it yourself guns over the summer, which all started because of a lawsuit that this administration settled, that they didn't need to settle. Um, The reality is those plans and prints for doing that are on the internet now. And while states like New York are making it illegal to do it, until somebody gets caught with it, it's hard to stop it. But no weapon works without a bullet. And so the focus of gun safety, we must deal with the, the weapon side, but we have to also deal with the ammunition side. And trust me, that does scare the daylights out of the gun lobby because there is no Second Amendment argument around ammunition. So, um, Al, Okay, Alan, you also had... Did anybody on this side have a question? I, I feel like it's been mostly right side. Oh, there, okay, sorry. The other side. Hi. Um, Hi. I have 13-year-old twin boys, and... This is kind of like a judgment call. They haven't really been afraid so far. You know, they're kind of guys, guys, and they, you know, live in New York, and they're used to being tough. But just the other day, we were invited to go do a special service at our temple. And they, for the first time, they expressed to me that they didn't want to go because they were afraid of me tearing up for this. Um, and so I didn't know. I spoke to them. As a mom, like, do I make them go because we have, you know, security guards outside? I mean... We, in the end, we didn't go because I wasn't going to make them go. Um, there's, you know, down the road they can go when they're more comfortable, but I wanted to get your opinion of that. You know, I, I think in the end, in that moment, you probably, there was nothing wrong with the decision that you made. And you certainly don't want people to have fear that keeps them from living life. So, you know, which is part of why in the media this year, I've spent a lot of time trying to get the media to take some of the attention off the kids that have been so active because kids need to be kids and we adults need to take care of this so that kids don't live in fear, so that kids aren't dealing with the reality of gun violence where they go to school, where they worship and where they play. Um, but it's, it's, it is a crazy time we're living in. Listen, these kids now, it is not ab, it is not uncommon for them to have to do, you know, gun safety drills in school. They, they, it is what they think about now. And so my hope is that we can start flipping this a little bit and start dealing with the reality of what's out there so the kids do feel safe. Sure. But for me, I thought, what if I make my kids go? What if I make them go and say, you can't look and stop looking at that and say, I saw it and they just have to leave it. I would just mention the statistics. I mean, you, and you say this as well. I've heard it, you know, school shootings, mass shootings, even though they are far yeah. more frequent than they should be, are very uncommon. Right, so the chances are infinitesimal that something would happen. Um, so we can't. Personally, I you know I've never I've tried to not live in fear. You know, that's been one of my mottos, which is why I'm a journalist and I've traveled to war zones and continue to report on stories that are sometimes difficult and sometimes dangerous. Um, but in terms of shootings, we should we should be fully aware of them. But I don't. I think fear is not necessarily helpful to anyone. But I. As a parent, also, I can't, you know, I don't think anybody can judge you or the kids. Yeah. 
No. We're <laughs> non-judgmental here. Uh, young lady in the back. Oh, thank you for calling me young. Since I'm a grandmother. <laughs> hey, so I'm a survivor. Fred, I've been following you for a long time. Uh, uh, my thank condolences you. for joining our thank club. Thank you. I lost my nephew to gun violence on November 11, 2008. I'm also a Marine, former sharpshooter, and I'm also an NRA member. So, so pretty much I'm like everything, you know, yeah. Moms of Man Action, we're here supporting you, we love you dearly, and again, we're sorry for your loss of Jamie. But I wasn't gonna say anything until I heard her question. The, the fact of the matter is that kids are being killed in my community every day, as we know. So I'm sorry that a lot of people are not aware that the gun violence is a constant thing, that kids are constantly living in fear. Two of my sons, one of my sons was shot, the second son was almost shot in Brooklyn, right? And I lost several friends. I say this to say what I tell my children is, this is the reality we lived in. A lot of us has been living this reality a lot longer than some of you guys. But we've been on this reality for a long time. The thing is, is just to show them that life is meant to be lived any which way you want to show them. I mean, the fear that I'm feeling yeah. that a lot of my, you know, I will call you guys my Jewish brothers and sisters, like I call it uh, Muslim, my brothers and sisters, I do that. But it's scary that you can't even go to temple or anywhere that gets shot. But the thing is, you can't change your lifestyle, though. Because if you change your lifestyle, they're going to be winning, right? So if your kids don't want to go to Temple that day, then you take them to an event in Temple the next day or the following day. The thing is, you just have to continue doing what is normal. Because God forbid if something's going to happen, it's going to happen anyway. But they cannot stop living, you know? And all due respect to your comment, um, which is great. I don't know you as a reporter, but I'm sure you're amazing. But the fact of the matter is, is that <laughs> gun violence is not a rarity. And we got to start changing our mindset with that. You know? it, it, mass what, shootings. I mean, I'm talking about mass shootings. Yeah, the, the concept of mass shootings is becoming more common, but still rare. Now, the everyday violence and shootings of, you know, on a much smaller scale, those are unfortunately a real reality. And, and you know, but to what you said, can't live in fear, but you can fight where we are now, and you cannot be okay with it, and you can be part of changing it. Of course. I'm just curious about you. What about so me? you're a victim, a survivor of gun violence. Yes. And the, a Marine vet. Marine veteran, yes. Desert and Street. still yet a member of the NRA, which, you know, some of these things don't seem to... Well, the only reason why I didn't... Uh, I haven't paid a membership for quite a while since I joined Moms Man Action, but technically they still have me in their roster. Okay. And the reason why, there's several folds. One, being a military personnel, the NRA is like the thing to do, especially back in the days. Right. right? And another thing I'm not is, judging, by the way. No, I'm just I know, curious. I'm not saying judging, but I'm just telling you my mindset. And there's been time when I wanted to step away, but the problem of me stepping away from the NRA is that when I say I'm an NRA member, other NRA members is going to listen to me. You understand what I'm saying? So oh, if yeah. I give up that card, then I won't have the conversation. I'll have a conversation with other fault with gun owners. They look at me and they're like, you I, can't, you, I can't mess with. They can mess with anybody else, but when they start talking the lingo as far as pro-gun, blah, 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 they're like, okay, yeah, I don't want to, yeah, I, I can't debate you too far. What's you know? your name? Marie Deleuze. Marie, do you find common ground? I mean, you must be able to find some common so ground sorry, with your fellow. I'm sorry, am I taking over this place? No, I think this is interesting. Is anybody else, I, I, you know, as journalists, I'm curious. If you have curious. any questions, please let me know. Ask my moms here. They know me uh, very well. So can you, this. when you speak to your fellow NRA members, do you find common ground as a survivor and a victim? The funny thing is that I find less common ground with my veteran friends than NRA members. I've been, I, I didn't go this year, but I've been to several NRA um, events in different states because we go to the different states because we want to show that we're standing for gun safety, right? So I've been to the actual show. And you'd be amazed at the conversation I had. I had an amazing conversation with a, sh with a former sheriff who lost a fellow member, sheriff, because they call sheriff, they like call a deputy. Him sheriff, deputy sheriff, to gun violence. And he was, his son was a former Marine. And we had like a 20 minutes conversation at the NRA gun, um, event convention. And he said to me, and he was selling holsters. Okay, so he was selling holsters for guns. And we had a 20 minutes conversation about what I'm doing, what he's doing. And the fact of the matter is, 
he believes in gun safety laws. And that's the thing that a lot of us miss with this whole conservative, I'm not conservative, I'm sorry. Sorry guys, I'm not. But that's the whole conversation that we're missing with the, con uh, the conservatives. A lot of the NRA members, a lot of the gun owners do believe in the same thing we do. It's just they fear of taking away the guns and that's being regulated by the executives. You, you listen, I, I say it on social media all the time. I have no issue with the majority of NRA members, they actually feel yes. the way you and I feel. Yes. The issue is with leadership yes. that does not represent their members no, well. No, they don't. Exactly. So. All right, thank you. Sorry for taking over. We got time for, we got time for one more. Uh, Alan, you go ahead. You're very patient there. Alan asks, whenever these events happen in other countries, New Zealand, Japan, wherever, Australia, France. What? I'm not clear how to deal with that one, Craig. I, I, I think that you must do that. Now, whether you do that at an educational level when children are young, and you begin to teach them about these things, about uh, whether you do it through religion. I, I don't know how to do that, but until you do, and Marie mentioned it, and somebody else mentioned it, people in South Dakota are no different than people in New York City. They just grow up differently culturally, and they have a different perception of the way things are. So we need to be able to get that information out to them so that there, there's some <laughs> sense of what to do. Your question, though, it's, it's deeper than that, and it gets to the reason why I said the day after my daughter was born, I'm going to break that effing lobby. Because that lobby is the issue. That lobby uses money and it uses media to hold legislators and legislation hostage, to make people afraid. And in the past, they've had a very typical pattern. When there was gun violence, they would wait about two weeks. You'd have your two weeks to get emotional and to vent and to talk about doing something. And then they would hit back fierce. And everybody would just stop. Okay, That lobby is what makes this country different than other countries. And that lobby is what must be defeated in order to start getting real change done in this country. Because you're competing with a very vocal segment that knows how to use the media, that knows how to create chaos, that knows how to sow fear, and we've got to stop them. Thank you, Fred. And I'm, uh, I'm just going to add a tiny bit of perspective and wrap it all up for us. Um, the gun lobby helps produce a lot of guns and make them available and protects the rights to buy weapons that are essentially used to kill people en masse. What, what's an AR-15 meant to do? It's not meant to shoot deer. It's meant to kill people. I mean, it, it's a prototype of an M4, which is the assault rifle that our military uses. But you also need people to go out and use these weapons to kill people. And I do believe that a large part of that is because of a dislocation that a lot of people feel and a lack of community. Um, and so whatever community you can find, hold on to it, be strong, um, you know, revel in it. Uh, and that's why I want to thank the people of this wonderful community here. Um, at the Thank Center for you. Jewish History, who've made this available and <laughs> invited this extraordinary, wonderful, courageous, loving, and still grieving father to be here with us tonight. So thank you so much, Fred. Thank you.